Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you on behalf of myself, our associate pastor Kathleen Stoltz, and uh, the entire congregation. We're happy to have you with us. Uh, a couple of uh, announcements as we get started. Uh, first, I want to remind you, there's uh, the red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew. hope that you'll pick that up, pass it down to the end, and then pass it back toward the center. It's one of the ways we get to know one another's names. And if you are visiting with us today, uh, maybe for the first time, we want to say a special word of welcome to you. I hope that you'll take uh, some time down at the bottom of the page. There's a place where you can share your contact information. And we'd love to be able to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. So we hope that you'll give us the opportunity to do that. I want to share a couple of announcements about some ways, uh, and starting with some ways that you can serve. And the first one is that we're going to be hosting the homeless here again this week through the Interfaith Hospitality Network. And so they'll be arriving today. And there are lots of opportunities throughout the week for you to get involved in that. There's a sign-up sheet uh, posted here right outside the doors. And uh, now we also have an online sign-up tool so that you can engage um, in uh, in, in <laughs> so that you can sign up through our website in order to uh, get engaged with that. And so our, if you go to our website, medfordumc.org slash IHN, and uh, there you'll find uh, that new tool, and I'm really excited about that. I think that's going to be a helpful thing, especially with uh, our people spread out all over the campus on Sunday mornings. I'm really appreciative of uh, Mike Paul for setting that up. So the other thing that's going to be happening is that we're having a diaper drive for the Christian Caring Center. That's going to start next week, and it continues through Father's Day. And so Christian Caring Center is one of our uh, mission partners, and we'd love to have your help with that. You can bring in diapers and drop them off here on Sunday mornings or throughout the week. Next Saturday, I want to let you know the United Methodist Women are going to be hosting their plant sale um, to support their ministry uh, uh, funding opportunities that they have. And also there's a hoagie sale that's uh, supporting our Canoe Carnival uh, team that gets together every year, builds a float as part of the Canoe Carnival festivities, um, and uh, that's a church float. So this is one of the ways that they raise money in order to be able to put that thing together every year. So that's taking place next Saturday, and you can place your orders uh, today uh, for both of those, uh, the plant sale and the hoagie sale. We also have a new members class that's coming up. If you've been thinking about joining the church, that's going to take place today after worship. I hope that I can recover my ability to think and to talk before then. And, uh, well, it might be helpful if I could do that during the sermon, I guess, too. But uh, this morning, after uh, this service, we're going to go right to Boker, and we're going to have a lunch, and there will also be child care provided. Even if you haven't RSVP'd for that, if you've been thinking about joining the church, we'd love to have you come and join us for it. And uh, it's going to be right upstairs in Boker. I think those are all the announcements. Kathleen? Good morning. Good morning. I invite you to stand as you're able and join me in our call to worship. In our everyday lives, in the day's news, we see evil triumphant and despair. Yet we cannot lose heart or hope. What does Paul say? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good.
may be seated. I invite you now to join me in our opening prayer. Loving God, call us together as your people. Transform us with your love. Transform our hearts that we may love generously. Transform our eyes that we may see your grace. Transform our hands that we may serve others. Transform our spirits that we may be the body of Christ, gathered to worship and sent out to serve. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. We will sing the wonders of your love forever, O God. We will proclaim your faithfulness to everyone we meet, young and old. For your merciful love lasts forever, as constant as the heavens above. Blessed are those who trust in you, who walk in the light of your presence. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you. Let's take a moment now to greet those around us with the peace of Christ.
a reading from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone with evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. So this week we're returning to our series about the questions that we have for God. And I don't want to belabor the intro because I've got my work cut out for me to try and answer uh, the question that we propose to answer today in a brief way, especially on a communion Sunday. But this question is one that several of you asked, and it's one that's certainly worth talking about. And it kind of builds on the question that we looked at two weeks ago, the idea of why are some tested more than others? This one is about the idea of how does evil fit into God's plan? And so let's take a moment as we begin and let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for the questions that you've placed in our hearts. We know that though at times the questions that we have seem like they get in the way of faith, we also know that just this process of exploring them and connecting with you in prayer and connecting with the scriptures in study, that these things help us to grow. And so we give you thanks for the questions, even when we don't understand exactly where they're leading us. So we pray that you might bring your wisdom to me, to everyone who's gathered here in this place, so that together we can think about something that really challenges us and come out with a new understanding. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in my experience, uh, suffering, whether we talk about it in, the, in this, kind of in the most micro of ways, so talking about our own lives, or if we look at it more on a global kind of scale, when we look around and we see how much hurt and how much pain there is in the world, This question of suffering is one that is an impediment to people's faith. I think it's probably the primary impediment. Gets in the way of people being able to believe that God is real and that God is good. And so every time that we have a confirmation class, Kathleen and I set aside some time. We meet with the kids and we talk with them. We do uh, an evening program that we don't know what else to call it except evil and suffering. And the kids, I'm sure, look at that and they're like, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to show up for the class on evil and suffering, right? But the reality is that if we don't talk about it, then we know that these questions are going to come into our lives and into our our hearts, whether whether we want to deal with them or not. So we just try to be able to be proactive about it and try to start talking about them in advance. So we should start this morning by taking a minute maybe to define our terms. And especially when we talk about the idea of a plan. When we talk about God's plan, what do we mean? 
Because as United Methodists, one of the things that we hold uh, very dear is the idea that God created each one of us with free will. So when we talk about God's plan, we're not talking about the idea, as some people believe, that kind of every single thing that happens, you know, is divinely ordained. That is not what we mean. Um, it is true, absolutely, that on, in some limited sense, and this would be a whole other sermon about the plan, right? There is some way in which we can talk about God's plan. There's, the scripture kind of forces us to be able to deal with that language somehow, because you have passages, um, and you may have this like on a refrigerator magnet or something, you know, at your house. You have passages like Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, right? Plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you hope and a future. So we can and we do talk, on the one hand, about God's plan and about God aligning circumstances for our benefit. We, we talk about that. There's no question. But if we take that to an extreme and we make the assumption that everything is happening according to God's plan, well, then it leads us to some pretty difficult places because that means that God is on the hook for a lot of bad stuff. So, for example, I mean, God would be on the hook for a, a mass shooting. God would be on the hook for a terrorist attack, right? If all these things are part of God's plan, well, then God's got, on some level, a lot to answer for. But you might ask, okay, so even if, you know, I get that, and even if you say this is not necessarily God's will that these things happen, this is not part of God's plan, don't you still have to deal with the fact that God allowed these things to happen. You know, that was the big question, for example, after September 11th. How could God allow this to happen? Right? That was the question people asked. More, you know, I was brand new in ministry at that time. I was still in seminary. And that was the question that people asked more than anything. And it wasn't really a great answer. Why does God allow this to happen? If you read my email on Friday, um, I tried to open up this line of thinking a little bit by talking about this challenge to faith that I think is presented when you take these three ideas and you try to put them together. One being the idea that God is good, another being the idea that God is all-powerful, and then the third idea being that evil exists. And so the challenge is you can take any two of those three and put them together and they can work. But as soon as you put all three together, and we do hold that all three are true, right? That God is all-powerful, that uh, God is good, and that evil exists. We hold that all three of those things are true. But if you put them together, you have a little bit of a logic problem. If God is really good and God has the power to eliminate evil, why does evil exist? Right? That's the challenge that you have. You can come back to the idea of free will, yes, and you can say, well, you know, it's all about free will. That's the reason why. But then that raises another question. Why is free will so darn important? Isn't the price of free will just way too high? Isn't there a better way? Why does God think that free will is so important? Why do we believe that free will is so important? So how does the scripture deal with the dilemma of evil? You could go through the scriptures, and I think that you can pick up any number of themes, but I want to talk about three ideas today. And the first one is one that shows up frequently, especially in the Psalms. The Psalms, I've been listening to them recently as I've been cleaning up the yard and picking up the thousands and thousands and thousands of sweet gumballs that are in my yard, right? I've been listening to the Psalms in my earphones, and um, I'm just struck by the fact that people are constantly in the Psalms crying out to God, saying, where are you? What are you doing? You seem to have disappeared. And the, the kind of the reassurances that you get in the face of that 
can maybe be summed up by what you find in Psalm 37. This is one that stuck out to me as I was, as I was cleaning up the yard. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. In other words, another way you could talk about this is to say, well, wait and see. Wait and see. Because evil eventually will self-destruct. There's always a reckoning for those who do wrong. You can look at Harvey Weinstein's fall from grace. You can look at Bill Cosby. You can't get away with hurting people forever. And so that's why Martin Luther King, in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, he was able to say this. He said, right temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. And there is within that statement the idea that right in and of itself has power. Goodness and truth have power. Now, how do I know this? Because it takes fear and force and coercion in order to keep evil in its place in terms of ruling over people. Think about a dictatorship. Think about, think about when the Nazis took over all of Europe. How big an army did it take in order to enforce the will of Hitler over Europe? It takes fear and force and coercion in order for evil to hold its place over people. But goodness and truth they don't require that kind of external support. They can stand on their own. They don't need force. They don't need coercion. They just stand on their own because people recognize them as being true. And eventually they will win out. Now, certainly there's a price to be paid while we're waiting for them to win out. In other words, we see a lot of suffering and a lot of pain in a lot of people's lives until they finally have their victory. But the Bible assures us that in the end, God wins. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. That's the whole idea of Judgment Day, right? Revelation is about kind of the end of the world, the judgment. Jesus talks about the judgment that the wicked will be punished, that the just will be rewarded. And all of this is very satisfying to us. It, you know, it makes us feel better about the way things are right now. But it doesn't much help someone who just lost their mother and father in a chemical attack in Syria, right? It doesn't help them right now. And that's the problem. You can look forward to the day when everything will be right, but what do we do now? But still, that's one approach. One approach to the question of evil is, wait and see, God will work it out. There's a second solution. Now, I'm not 100% sure that everybody's going to agree that it is a valid solution. But it's the solution that's suggested to us by Job. So a couple of weeks ago, when I preached that other sermon about uh, why are some tested more than others, we talked about Job. And so if you read through Job, I know some of you said that that's one of the things that you wanted to do coming off of that sermon. You get to the end, you get to chapter 38, God shows up. Job, remember his story, he's a righteous man, he undergoes all this suffering, he has a lot of questions, why is this happening to me? God, how could you permit this? He gets to the end and he's talking to God because God shows up and fundamentally the answer that God provides if you really want to be serious about it, it's kind of a non-answer. It's basically summed up by the idea, how can a human ever expect to understand God's ways? And what makes you think that you should even try? And that's painful, but in the end, that might be the most obvious way to go, is to say, you know what? I can't explain it, I can't understand it, I don't know how to understand it. And furthermore, you know, if you look at certain passages of scripture, 
the message that we get is God is under no obligation to explain to you why things are the way they are. Now that's not satisfying at all. But Job walks away from this meeting with God kind of in awe. And in the oldest sense of that word awe, where it's not just about like being, but being like, right? Terrified that God is there. And so he walks out of this meeting with God saying, I'm not going to say anything else. Literally says, I clap my hand over my mouth. I'm done. I, I can't say anything else. And so I think about this. I think about what's likely to happen on the day when I pass from this life. You know, I have all these questions I bring with me just the same way that you have questions that you bring with you. What I think is going to happen, honestly, is that when you're in the presence of God, those questions fall away. They become completely unimportant and irrelevant. They don't matter anymore. But yet, I know that for some of you, that also is very unsatisfying. To think that our questions won't matter, and maybe don't matter. But it is another way. If you can hold on to your faith, and simply trust that God knows what God is doing, then you may find that getting an answer to your question isn't really all that important at the end of the day. But the key phrase there is if, if you can hold on to your faith, which may be challenging if you're the kind of person that wants to have those questions answered. So, two options so far. Wait and see, God will work it out eventually, or trust in God's wisdom and set aside your questions. You might say, I don't like either of those options. Do you have a third? (laughs) Right? And I get that. Maybe the third won't be all that satisfying to you either. I can't make any promises. But the third one, for it, we have to turn to the New Testament. You'll note that up to this point, I've only been quoting from the Old Testament. But there is more to the story. When I look at Jesus, I look at him as kind of flipping the script and changing the way that we talk about this, breaking the rules about how we think about these challenges. Let me just go back to the Old Testament just for another minute. Aren't the stories of the Old Testament, take for example the flood in Genesis, aren't the stories of the Old Testament, many of them are about God trying to rid the world of evil. And the flood story is about a decision that God makes to say, well, if I want to wipe out evil from the world, I'm going to have to wipe out all those who do evil from the world. And that's the story of the flood. Only Noah and his family are deemed righteous enough to be able to, you know, to keep living. And there's something appealing to this idea of God just reaching out and saying, okay, I'm done with all those who cause pain and hurt for everybody else. I'm done with you. You're finished. There's something that's very appealing about that for us as human beings. We like that. But to use a term that we've become very familiar with over the past 10, 20 years, right? what about collateral damage? You can't do something like that without hurting a whole lot of people in the process. Maybe some who didn't deserve it at all. How many wars have we fought claiming that we were fighting the war in order to secure the peace. How many times have we done that? Don't we usually end up just leaving behind a lot more enemies? Have we ever thought that maybe if we want peace, maybe the best way to go about it is not to get into a war? Have we ever thought about that? So when I read the New Testament, what I see is God taking a totally different approach to this problem. What if God's plan for defeating evil means not participating in it in any way? 
In other words, recognizing that the end goal is important, but the process by which you get there is just as important. That these two things have to line up. And that if you're God, they have to line up perfectly. So Jesus on the cross doesn't smite his enemies. He doesn't call down fire from heaven. He doesn't call down legions of angels, as he says to his disciples. Don't you know that I could call down legions of angels? I could change this if I wanted to. This doesn't have to happen to me. But instead, he's willing to die. He won't engage in violence, period. And so even when people are killing him, he doesn't curse them. Instead, he forgives them. And so Paul, in this passage from Romans, calls on us to do the same. What does he say? He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Do not repay evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. Now this sounds like Jesus, right? It sounds almost exactly like the Sermon on the Mount. Turn the other cheek. Bless those who persecute you. Again, if we keep reading in this passage, if your enemies are hungry, then feed them. If they're thirsty, then why don't you give them something to drink? By doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Now, okay, you might get to that and you say, wait, that just undermined your argument. Okay. The idea is here, not literally to dump burning coals on someone's head, okay? But the idea instead to shame them. So scholars look at this and they talk about, uh, they have a couple different theories, but the, I think the main one is the idea of the heat making your face red so that you're shamed. The idea being that you're killing them with kindness to the point where they realize yeah, I guess I regret having acted that way because this person has been good to me even though I did not deserve it. So you're winning over evil by demonstrating how hollow evil is and that you're not going to participate in it. So to come back to where we started, what if God's answer to the question about evil and how it fits into God's plan. What if the answer to that question is this? That God doesn't destroy evil because in order to do that, God would have to play by its rules. And God refuses to play by its rules. Instead, what Jesus came to do was to show us that the rules are changed and they can be changed. Because of what God has done and is doing in the world. To show us that through the cross, there is an entirely different way. Now, I don't want to pretend that this is simple. I don't want to pretend even that this is necessarily satisfying. It is a whole lot more satisfying to imagine that God, again, in the words we find in Job, might take the earth by its corners and shake evildoers out of it. That's a lot more satisfying to us. we don't have the God we want. We have the God we have. And the God that we have is the one who went to the cross for us. That's the God we have. The one who challenges us then to take up our own cross and follow him. Amen?
Amen. You may be seated. And as we continue now our service of worship, if you are visiting with us maybe for the first time, we want to say thank you for being here. We're going to be receiving an offering. You don't need to feel obligated to put anything in the offering plate today. If you are our guest, uh, we want to thank you for being here and look forward to seeing you again. Let's continue now by offering God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. <laughs> Join me, please, in our prayer of dedication. Lord, with these, these gifts, gifts, we, we recommit, recommit ourselves to serving as you, as you would have us serve. We work against evil by filling up the world with your goodness. It is a long, slow, tiresome work, but we trust that you have called us to it, and so we offer these gifts as a sign of our commitment. Bless us with wisdom and your spirit to live and love as Jesus did. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> So as we prepare to celebrate communion today, I remind you that the table does not belong to the United Methodist Church, but it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the one who issues the invitation. That invitation is to all who seek to live in a new relationship with God and with their neighbor through him. So all of you are welcome here. Today we'll be receiving by intinction, which means that you'll be given a piece of bread to dip in the cup. We'll come by the center aisle, we'll return by the side aisles. If you can't come forward for whatever reason, please let us uh, know, let the ushers know. We'll be sure to bring the elements to you. 
as you're coming forward, I invite you to be in prayer for that person who's in front of you in the line so that each one of us can be prayed over individually this morning. We also have uh, gluten-free elements uh, that are, uh, that's what we're going to be using today. So uh, just to make you aware of that. Oh, we have those. Okay, I'm sorry. They're available at, the, uh, at the right hand, your right-hand station. So let's continue now with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And because you are so good, it's a good and joyful thing always for us to just come before you and lift our joys. So are there joys that we have to share? We had celebrations about uh, Scott's graduation at the first service, and I know there are other graduates um, coming up, too, through our, through our congregation. But are there other joys? That my son-in-law, Paul Pellegrino, is home safely from Puerto Rico. Amen. 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 Give thanks for Marta. Thanks. Amen. Other joys? And so, with your company of people and all the company of heaven, okay. <laughs> um, I've caught it from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fine, keep going. We praise your name and we join their unending hymn. <laughs> holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. And we trust that when we gather together in his name and we lift our prayers to you, that you hear us. And so we come to you this day with these concerns on our hearts. Um, one concern that we have and one um, prayer that we want to lift up is for Gen Jenny Feliciano, um, who serves us so well as our custodian. Her mom passed away um, very recently, and so there will be a service for her. Um, but we pray for Jenny and for her family on the passing of Hilda. Are there other concerns that we have? Finally, oops, go ahead. It's for your son. We pray for him. Finally, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your son and for all that his coming means, not only for us and our lives, but for the world. By the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. And you delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night before Jesus went to the cross, he had dinner with his disciples. And at that dinner, he took the bread and he gave thanks to you. Then he broke the bread and he shared it with them. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He shared the cup with his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna. 
the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Now pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who Who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to share in this meal together, the meal that unites us as one through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to remember that, that we are your servants as we go into the world. May this meal strengthen us and give us courage and patience, and above all, may it give us love for one another. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. go forth into the world knowing that Christ goes with us, that Christ came in order to change the rules so that we would understand that evil can't be overcome by evil, but only with good. Go forth in the name and in the power of Jesus Christ. Be changed in the world. Go forth in his strength and in his grace. Amen.